Hi, David Visard here, and you are watching Power Tech 10. Give me 10 or 20 minutes of your time, and in return, I will give you the experiences of building race winning engines for the last 64 years. Now, the subject of this video is, I would say, a little esoteric. Not sure what that word means, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Anyway, what we're going to look at is something which kind of stirred my annoyance, right? And that is the statement that superchargers increase the volumetric efficiency of an engine, right? So I'm going to deal with that. But the other thing I'm going to deal with is the fact that most dyno operators do not know how to do the correction factors correctly for a supercharged engine. So we're going to deal with that right now. Some good news for you guys that build supercharged engines, especially, especially those with a positive displacement blower like a Roots or a Magnuson or something like this. And the good news is you're all doing your dyno tests wrong. How, how sure am, am I of it being all? About 99.9%. .9%. Now, how come that can be good news? I'll let you stew on that a while, right? But still on the subject of dynos, um, I have noticed when I have to borrow somebody else's dyno, and this usually happened when I was in California, and my dyno was out of commission, usually because we were updating it or rebuilding something. For I have found that their dynos always read too much. When I say always, what I mean is always. And, you know, I've had to... Conf now, I haven't used that many other dynos, right? like three. And I've had to confront the dyno operator as to why it's, re why it's reading so high. No, 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 Your engine, it's a good engine. No, it doesn't make that much horsepower. That, that reading's wrong, right? And he says, well, uh, and they've all been super flow dynos. And every one of them has said, we can put the calibration beam on it, if you like, and you'll see it's spot on. And they said, well, I'm not worried about the calibration beam. I'm worried about the little knob underneath that you turn to alter the rate at which it corrects figures right um, that's in terms of smoothing the curve itself because dynos digital assisted dynos don't read a smooth curve it goes up and down like this and it's a high spot low spot and it depends whether that little um, uh, uh, torque meter takes a power figure right at the point where a cylinder has just fired and it's putting its maximum pressure on the cylinder compared with a little while later while none of them are. So you, you get curves which, they're not really curves, they're spikes like this. Now, the normal thing is, is to smooth them 50% all the way through. But some people will turn that little knob under the dash of a super flow dyno so it corrects to say 75 percent of the up and down well can read 10 12 horsepower more anyway i confronted this one guy i said there you go well, after we had set it to 50 percent we ran the engine again and it made within about two horsepower on his super flow as it made on my super flow right so I asked him, well, why do you do that? And he says, well, he says, your average guy comes in here and he's thinking he's got this whiz kid engine and what happens? We dyno it and it's 50 to 100 horsepower down. So we try and make them look better. When we correct the figures, the output figures of an engine, one of the things that we have to do and all Superflow dyno owners, probably a lot of others as well, will realize they have to put the bore and stroke of the engine in. Now, this is done because the system calculates what the typical friction level 
of the engine will be for that bore and stroke. Now, let us say we've got this airplane and when it's sitting at sea level on a runway that's at sea level, right, the cylinders make 150 horsepower. And I've got this written down here so I don't get confused myself, right? But just as an example, we'll say that 50 horsepower is lost to friction. And that's always lost to friction at the RPM we're taking peak power, right? So we'll, we'll say 3,000 RPM, right? So at the propeller, there's 100 horsepower. <laughs> now let's fly that plane up, I don't know, 25,000 feet, where the air pressure is only half, right? Then the cylinders only make 25 horsepower. But 50 horsepower is lost to friction, which means at the propeller, there's only 25 horsepower. Now, if we were to just correct for the output of the engine based on the propeller power, we would say because of the increase in altitude, we've only got half the air pressure. So the power will actually, when we correct it, we have to multiply it by two. Well, that comes to 50. We already know it makes 100 corrected horsepower at the propeller. So why didn't it work out? Simple, it hasn't allowed for friction. So let us say we add the 50 horsepower to the, seven, to, to, to the 25, that gives us 75 horsepower in the cylinders, right? Now then, then we correct that. That comes to 150. Then we then subtract the friction, 50 horsepower, comes to 100. That's our corrected figure. Right. Now, here's the deal. The friction figures are for a normally aspirated uh, engine. And before right. I go any further, I want to make a statement. A supercharger does not, underline not, big letter. Let's see if I can write it backwards. Yes, I can. I can write it backwards, right? Brain damage can't have been as bad as I thought. Anyway, here's what happens. When we put a, uh, we'll say we put on a mechanical blower, like a 871 GMC blower, and, and I can't remember all the numbers, but let us say we've got it geared so that on our 500 cubic inch engine, it blows in 500 cubic inches. Now, only every other stroke of that engine is an intake stroke. So, if this, there's no leakage, if this supercharger displaces 500 inches, right, then when that engine turns over once and draws in 250 cubes, this will feed it 500 inches. So, there should be, the, the boost pressure should be 15 pounds a square inch. That's 15 atmospheric ones and plus a 15 pounds boost. Now, here's the deal. That engine is a supercharged engine. It's not the pistons and crankshaft which dictate how much air should go in the engine. It's the blower, right? This piston and stroke deal comes to 500 inches, but the blower determines how much air goes in. And it's a 500 inch blower, right? Uh, this is a four stroke engine, so it has to go two revolutions for 500 inches, right? So one revolution, 250, one revolution, 500, right? So our engine is not a 500 cubic inch engine. It's if we rotate it two, two times as per the formulas in the dyno, the blower rotates to put in a thousand cubic inches. So when we put in the, uh, when we want to get the friction numbers, we've got to include the fact that this engine is supercharged and part of the engine is the blower. We can't just ignore it, right? So we have to take the friction level of the engine plus the blower, which means instead of putting in our bore and stroke, we have to put in the displacement of the blower when the engine makes two revolutions. Now, 
What this means is, is that all of those guys who've tested supercharged engines on the dyno, their friction correction has been too low. They've never accounted for the friction in the blower, which is quite a lot, by the way. So, all of their numbers that they get are low. The good news, guys, is that you are better at building supercharged engines than you thought you were. How's that for a revelation? So, just how inefficient can a root-style blower positive displacement blower B to make so much difference that it would show up on the correction factors. Well, let's put this into perspective. Top fuel dragsters use a positive displacement blower and your typical hop-tap Corvette engine doesn't even make enough horsepower to drive the supercharger at the speed it runs at on that dragster engine. A figure which you should bear in mind is that the overall efficiency of one of these blowers is only about 55%. Now, we shouldn't paint every supercharger, positive displacement supercharger, in the same manner. One of the things that I can tell you here, and this is based on years of working with Jerry Magnuson, he was the boss at Magnet Chargers. And he was one, and I've said this before, he was one of the 20th century supercharger designers who got top results. He is also the mastermind behind the most sold supercharger on the face of the planet. Now I'm going to show you a couple of shots here that are relevant. First off, take a look at this next shot. Because of great attention to detail in rotor design, these uh, Magnuson superchargers on a duty cycle, that is a street driven or a street and freeway driven cycle, rival the efficiency, and uh, we're talking fuel efficiency here, as well as horsepower, of a turbo. On this LS engine here, this magnet charger made about 750 horsepower for a truck application. The secret is, other than efficient rotor design, the fact that it has a bypass valve, which when you're at cruise, the supercharger appears invisible to the rest of the engine. So you, this setup does not suffer the parasitic losses of a typical supercharger lacking some sort of valve like this. I've used a number of these Magnuson blowers, all to good effect. Now, Let's look at one of the two secrets of this blower. First, the design of the rotors has been perfected over... Perfected. I should not have used the word perfected there. It has been refined until it's got to a state where during a test cycle, which includes freeway and roads, the overall efficiency of that blower rivals that of a turbocharger. However, the thing about a supercharger like this is instant boost. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get instant boost with a turbo, but that's another subject for another day. One of the key factors with the Magnuson supercharger is this valve. What this does is at part throttle, this valve opens and it completely bypasses the supercharger, which means that when you don't need boost, the blower appears not to be there. The price to pay for this is that that supercharger, that Magnuson supercharger, absorbs about the same amount of power as an alternator that's not having any load placed on it. And that's pretty good. So, if I was going to recommend a supercharger for you guys who want a supercharger, the Magnuson supercharger is the best one to get. 
Okay, that brings us to the end of our video here. Don't forget, like, subscribe, notifications, share, and hit that thanks button. Again, all the money from that thanks button is going to St. Jude's, right? So don't be stingy. Kids there need your help. If we save a life, then we save two parents the incredible grief of losing a child. I'm calling this charity the Grief Relief Fund. Thank you for watching.